traditional meaning of bondage is as a condition of a man or woman considered a household or farm animal, a serf, less than a Roman servant. So when they bond you, they're not even considering you a slave. Well, the word slave comes from slav, and that's exactly what they mean. They don't consider you to be a servant, as in the concept of servants that row the galleys under the Roman Empire. They're considering you an animal, a household or farm animal. And that's precisely what the Magyar family elite consider all you to be, perversely. I mean, these are the people that converted to Menachism, took it over and decided to knock off the founders of Menachism in the 19th and 20th century. They're the, a criminal gang that basically took over their identities. These people have no rights whatsoever. These are the same people that trashed the Talmud, that ended the world in, in the World War II, did the years of tribulation, killed six million because they thought that that was the figure that was needed, ended the covenant, claimed the end of the world, started the new world order, rose to the top, said, we are controllers and you're animals. And then they quote their own religious claims and their fictitious Noahide laws, laws that they created. The Noahide laws are completely fictitious, created these to say, we're the elite, you're the animals. That's the original corruption of the word bondage. So in Canon 2073, by definition, a bond can only be issued if the entity possesses some form of official control over one or more persons. Bonds are issued because persons are considered animals, worse than slaves, consistent with the original meaning. So that is why three groups have a natural right to issue bonds. Municipalities, possessing hospital and psychiatric control over ratepayers as outpatients, living in wards. You live in a ward, you pay council rates, the municipality can issue bonds. A second is state and federal governments administering the the Sesta KV Trust and treating people as, or persons I should say, as legal slaves and property. And the third, and the one that is uh, of interest to us today, is courts. Courts as temporary executors, guardians and trustees of persons who are charged and processed through them. So now you know what is behind these bonds. Now, continuing uh, down to 2075, there's a definition there of 2074, explains what these are, these different types of bonds. But when we get down to 2075, let's have a quick look at this, and then we'll move on. So in 2075, as the primary purpose of all Roman courts is to make money, and that is the meaning of court, by the way, court comes from the word courtio, and courtio means literally to bond. It means bonds, securities, and bailments. means making money. That's what court means. Courtio means making money. That's why they hide the original meaning of the word court and claim it from cohort, which is just <laughs> absurd. But anyway, that's dictionaries. So as the primary purpose of all Roman courts is to make money, not honour the law, Generally, two bonds are issued and sold secretly for all cases successfully processed, being a bid bond and a performance bond. Okay? Now, the bid bond is issued usually once an indictment has been entered, and the courts will normally not permit the grant of any form of bail bond, which is usually a performance bond, as an offset against the same price as the bid bond, until the accused has agreed to be under the control of the court. And you'll find this again and again and again. Until you submit to the court, until you agree to be treated basically as an animal, until you allow the court to make its first dirty, filthy cash from you, they will often, in many cases, not free you, not give you the opportunity. Now, there's nothing lawful about that. 
nothing lawful about that, even in their system. But once they can torture you into agreeing, then usually the court will uh, issue a bond and you can pay it or you can go and get a bail bond uh, offset for it. And the second one is then the performance bond and that's normally uh, a significant multiple of the original bid bond after the successful consent of the convicted man or woman agreeing to the sentence. So that's bonding. All right, moving through because time is running short and I hope I'm not running through these too quickly for you but I'm, I'm mindful of the time and I want to show you one more on positive law before we get to cognitive law. And the next one I want to show you on positive law is the concept of bidding. Now, bidding is Article 130 under Agreement, Creation and Performance. This is something that's been updated since we've spoken last. So I'm going to get through this one quickly. Article 130, bidding. You might need to refresh the page when you get there. But I want to get to this because this is answering a mystery that many have seen in the courts. Okay, so Canon 2286. Bidding is the process of reaching an agreement through the process of offering a good service or security for sale and then securing its sale to the highest bidder, usually through a formal process such as an auction. So bidding is in effect the formalization of the ancient art of haggling. Now it shows that there are four types of auctions as a form of, of bidding. Before we get to that, let's just go to 2287. Sorry, I want to say this. Where does the word come from? And again, another lie when you look at the, the original claims of auction. But the word auction is derived, is truly derived from the Latin word auctionis, meaning a sale of slaves through a bidding process. That's the original meaning, a sale of slaves through a bidding process. And it, it originates in in Latin. That's what they did. In fact, there was a special register of slaves, which were called tabuli. That's where the word table comes from. Tabuli was the name for registers of slaves. That's what it was called. And they even gave a special name for the register of slaves for an auction. And they called it, guess what? Auctionarius. So if someone says to you, oh, auction doesn't come from the auction of slaves, we can say, well, why would they call the register, the tabuli, which itself means a register of slaves, why would they call it auctionarius if it wasn't the original meaning? So the sale of bonds of slavery in honour of this ancient Roman process is continued today, and guess where? In the Roman courts with the use of the block and gavel. There's the connection between the bond and the auction. The auction in tradition is in the selling of slaves. And that is why our friends, the black-robed Baal priests, the Gali, are more than happy to have a block and gavel in their temples where they sit in complete ignorance to the history, in arrogance and malice. So let's have a quick look at 2289. As Roman courts seek to perfect the sale of bonds, and that's their job. That's what a court does. A court's there to make money. It's got nothing to do with the law. Please, if anyone ever says to you the courts are there to uphold the law, that is complete and utter rubbish. By definition, court comes from courtio, meaning to sell bonds, bailments, and uh, other forms of securities. So as Roman courts seek to perfect the sale of bonds against the accused, the judgment also represents the opening highest price of an open descending price auction. That's its technical name, but you probably know it as what's called a Dutch auction. That's what you're witnessing in court, a Dutch auction. With the judge or magistrate as the auctioneer. Now, unless the accused or the convicted makes a lower legitimate bid, because that's what you've got to do, a lower legitimate bid, the original highest bid, the sentence, is deemed the sale price and the accused is assumed to have consented by the time the judge strikes the block with their gavel and the auction is over. That's the purpose of the 
gavel. Now, what some magistrates and judges do, and I've heard this many times, is that if, if the accused starts to speak after the sentence, they will bang down the gavel to signify the auction has ended. That is an illegal auction, an unlawful auction. It means that the judgment is immediately null and void. Now, unfortunately, if you're dealing with a stupid judge, a stupid magistrate, a corrupt judge or a corrupt magistrate, they're not going to tell you that they have just fundamentally destroyed the court case by an act. That act. It is only on appeal can this be highlighted. In, in the case of an appeal, it is normally and should be enough grounds for the matter to either be retried or dismissed. Because in an auction, you, particularly when you are standing in front of them, you have the right to offer a lower bid. Now, there's been some confusion, and I want to clear this up, in terms of what people are doing when a judge issues a judgment. Some people are simply saying, I do not consent. Because we're dealing with a Dutch auction, and I apologise if this has not been clear enough, the only valid response is a lower bid. You are in a haggle at this point. Now, this is separate to the concept of elocution. You are haggling an auction before we talk about elocution. So here in this matter of the um, auction, the only valid response is to offer a lower competing bid, a valid competing bid. If they say 10 years, you have to say something within the context of that which is legitimate. Uh, I object. I do not consent. Um, I consent only to 12 months community service or something. You need to offer something as a competing bid. If you offer nothing, then you haven't submitted a valid bid and the highest bid stands. So we'll talk a bit more about this in the future and I hope this clears up what is going on with the block and gavel and the whole auction at the end of a case. Remember, this is separate to the discussion on elocution. Okay. Now, I want to cover some areas on the um, issue of uh, cognitive law. And I want to share with you some of the updates on cognitive law. So, uh, on cognitive law, to get to cognitive law, I ask you please go and have a look at the home page and click on cognitive law. Uh, you'll see that it's the third link down. Now, positive law will be updated and the numbering of ecclesiastical law will be updated as well. So I ask you, during the next few days, please accept my apology that the numbering for ecclesiastical as well as the final numbering for positive is not finished. So you will find that there are canons that have the same number. Please, that is a process that's being updated. What I want to show you with cognitive law, apart from the fact that it's finished, is some key insights at the back end when we talk about influence of mind. So I do hope all who are on the call will take the time to go through and read what has been presented in terms of the canons of cognitive law. It was a much, much bigger process than I thought it would be. It's taken a lot, lot longer than I thought it would take. But it turns out that the mind, or in Latin they call ment, or mentis, is absolutely a key, key element to understanding their system. Now, of course, I know that you understand this, many of you understand this, but in order for us to discuss the mind, in order for us to deal with the kind of issues of psychoval and the kind of pressure they put us under, it wasn't good enough to simply ignore uh, these areas, but to be able to express them and in many cases consume the ground that groups like psychology have been using. So in the time available before we get on to questions in about 15, 20 minutes. I want to go through some key sections here and I hope you find what we talk about useful. So I'm just going to pick through a couple of these. 
because there's too much to go through in, in one go. For those that 